I'm Ian Middleton from the Humanist Council of New Zealand. Um, in our country, in many Western countries, we count ourselves quite lucky because um, we're not really in danger of our lives or other types of threats. It um, wasn't quite the same in the past, but um, nowadays the um, hotspots of, of religious extremism tend to be confined to certain areas. Um, this disposition often makes them feel um, indifferent, so indifferent to the idea of proactive humanism. So many people in New Zealand and some of our Western countries just don't feel the need, the problems that other people in other parts of the world are feeling. So drawing from this experience and living and working as a humanist in Africa, Leo will show up that irrational beliefs and violent fanaticism that rage in places across Africa have transnational roots and connections. Superstitions and dogmatic beliefs pose a serious threat to our common humanity. He contends that active involvement in, of all humanists, whether in New Zealand or in Papua New Guinea, is needed to eradicate irrational beliefs worldwide. Now, I um, first became aware of Leo something like 20 years ago when he first emailed me. Um, shortly before that, he'd actually founded his own humanist society in a country that didn't have one, and that takes some courage. Leo specialised in campaigning against and documenting the impacts of child witchcraft accusations. He holds a PhD from the Beirut International School of African Studies in Germany and has held leadership roles in the Nigerian humanist movement, Atheist Alliance International and the Centre for Inquiry in Nigeria. In 2012, he was appointed as a research fellow of the James Randi Education Foundation where he continues working towards the goal of responding to what he sees as the deleterious, deleterious effects of superstition. Advancing scepticism throughout Africa and around the world. In 2014, Leo was chosen as a laureate of the International Academy of Humanism. And in 2017, he received the Distinguished Services to Humanism Award from the IHEU. Leo says, most Africans cannot think freely or express their doubts openly because these religious have placed a huge price on free thinking and critical inquiry. Belief in dem demonic possession, faith healing, and the restorative power of holy water can have deadly consequences for believers and whole communities. Africa needs to adopt this cultural motto, dare to think, dare to doubt, dare to question. Lot of, uh, Leo, please. <laughs> Thank you, Ian, for that introduction. Um, thank you, New Zealand Humanists, for inviting me to your country and for giving me the opportunity to address this meeting. Yes, let me thank especially Gillen and uh, Ian Middleton for the care and hospitality you've extended to me and to my other colleagues uh, who are from uh, non visa waving countries because i noticed that there are two categories of humanists here humanists from visa waving countries and humanists from non visa waving countries pardon me i may mix it up because i don't know how it works so thank you also for the for those frightening stories of earthquakes we don't have earthquakes in nigeria even i have not experienced a tremor yeah and also from the scaring experience of walking across this swing bridge. In my country, bridges, they have pillars. They don't shake. So not to talk of swinging, no. So, so you have really made my first visit to your country memorable. 
and I will forever be grateful. So thank you, New Zealand Humanist, for going an extra mile to ensure that I was issued with a visa. After my visa application was denied, I count myself lucky. Now, I have alluded to the visa experience in order to put this conversation in a proper perspective. And to stress a point, luck is a universal experience. Fortune smiles at everybody at some point and in some respects, even the most unfortunate person. However, too often we tend to forget that luck is a form of resource. That being lucky places one in a position of power that can be utilized to one's advantage or to other's advantage. So the main issue is how do we utilize the luck capital of humanism? By luck capital here, I mean, oh, I am lucky I'm a humanist. Like in Nigeria, people are dying, they're going to vigil, they're praying every day. I don't. They go to church every, on Sundays, I sleep. It's, an, it's a day to have an extra sleep, you know. And when they go to church in Nigeria, everywhere is quiet. So that is one of the calmest moments you enjoy sleeping. Yes. So the luck we enjoy, either because we are humanists or we are living in a country where humanists can feel very safe. So at international meetings like this, humanist participants often point, point out uh, the point to how unfortunate they are, especially after listening to what they often describe as depressing and graphic reports of superstition and religion-based abuses from Africa. These remarks usually go along this line. We are lucky. I'm sure you have heard that today. You have heard that. So we are lucky we don't have, the, we don't have to face this kind of situation in my country. We are fortunate we don't have to deal with these things in our own part of the world. Well, these remarks are often made with very good intentions. There are attempts to express admiration for the bold initiatives and courageous work that humanist activists are doing in difficult places around the world. At the same time, these feedbacks come with some undertone of distance and disconnection. They resonate with streaks of helplessness regarding the frightful predicament of humanists in far off places like Bangladesh or India or Afghanistan, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and in other places where humanist activities are actually very risky. Now here, I use two examples to show that the problems humanists are facing in Africa and Asia are not as distant as they seem. They're, they're connected. There's some connection. And we have to work on this connection. So I argue that humanists who consider themselves fortunate by virtue of their lifestyles or location should seriously consider investing their luck capital into addressing, uh, into addressing the challenges that humanists face. Now, the first problem is the, the problem of witchcraft accusation. Abuses that are associated with witchcraft beliefs have been widely reported. Graphic details of, of the abuse of mainly elderly women and children suspected of witchcraft in African and um, Asian Oceanic communities have continued to emerge. So there have been horrifying accounts of accusations and killings of alleged witches from Nigeria, Malawi, uh, Ghana, South Africa, India, Nepal, Papua New Guinea. Now, the tendency is to, is to see these child and elderly witch hunts in many parts of the world as a third world phenomenon, which these countries will hopefully outgrow. You know, one of my Facebook friends, oh, you people have to deal with, you have to deal with this thing. This is your problem. It is not only our problem. It is, it is not only our problem, as in those of us living in Africa and India, it is our problem as a generation, as people living in the same world. So, so they think that these are problems that these countries will have to outgrow. So many people are inclined to thinking that witchcraft-related abuses are troubles that are so localized and restricted to certain parts of the world. Now, no matter how you choose to frame the issue, it is pertinent to note that witchcraft accusations in various parts of the world are more complex than they seem. And allegations of witchcraft in places such as Nigeria, India, and Papua New Guinea are linked to certain structures and operations that are beyond the local. 
Now, let's take, for example, the recent report by the BBC that highlighted the continued abuse of children uh, in, 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 the, in the name of witchcraft in some parts of Nigeria. Actually, the, the, the photo there is what they used to illustrate the, the case of uh, abuse of children in Nigeria. Now, while this, this report reconfirms the existing knowledge that accusations of witchcraft is a family and neighborly affair, there have been shocking revelations of abuses in migrant communities in Europe. So African and Asian witchcraft have gone global. Now, the fact that these allegations are taking place in migrant communities, some people have argued, is not the issue. You, some people said, oh yeah, it is not our issue. It is still in the migrant communities. It is still African issues. Now, but my question is this. Have witchcraft narratives in all its forms totally disappeared in contemporary Western countries, as people assume? Now, reports have shown that religious establishments in the West have not completely abandoned rituals that are associated with witchcraft, such as, such as belief in demon possession and the practice of exorcism. Now, the question I keep asking is this. Now, they are doing exorcism. What are they exorcising? What is that? The Western church still actively promotes the idea that demons can possess human beings and that these demons can be expelled through prayers and rituals. The Catholic Church still maintains an office for an exorcist, and recently the Vatican convened a meeting uh, of exorcists, and some of the priests there are, those, are part of those who participated in the meeting, according to BBC report. And this meeting was convened to address what they called pastoral emergency following an increasing demand for exorcism in Catholic communities. So there is a strong link between witch hunting and exorcism, and conventions such as this give credence and legitimacy to the process of witch persecution and witch finding in African countries. In fact, charismatic Catholic priests across Africa have been actively expelling demons and witches and other occult forces in the region. Now, also, many African Pentecostal churches with affiliates in Europe and America have been involved in witch hunting business. And some of the African-initiated churches already have branches, and some are trying to come and establish their branch, like um, this man from Kenya, in Western countries, including in Australia and, um, and in New Zealand. So it is not just our thing. It's coming. It's not just coming. They're already here. Because this man has contacts. He has local address. If you could check that, he has local address. So they're already here. So don't think that they, it is with us. It is an African thing. It is our thing. And we, the earlier we begin to see it that way, the better for us. Now, in fact, the Indian counterparts are reaching out as well, providing astrological services to remove black magic, voodoo, and witchcraft. So how distant are we really from the reality of witchcraft accusation, witchcraft beliefs? Now, in fact, one of the Pentecostal church pastors visited Australia and New Zealand some years ago. He didn't come alone. He didn't come to look at the mountains. You know? No. He came to visit churches. He came to establish the branches here in New Zealand. And these are which believe in churches. Actually, we were able to mobilize and we did some protests and, um, in Australia. And, and one, of the one of the people who attended the gathering in Australia, he wrote me and said that when he came to one of the gatherings in Australia, he said, I was told you people don't believe in witchcraft. <laughs> yeah, because we, we did this campaign and protest. So it is important that we begin to understand that this is an international, that this poses an international challenge. So reports have also noted the role of other actors, including state police and courts, human rights NGOs, and, um, and the UN agencies, the Amnesty International, in addressing the problem of witchcraft accusation in Africa and Asia. Yes, UN says they have been doing it, but I'm frustrated by what UN is doing. Because they are interested, UN agencies and UN workers are interested in their job. They're not interested in these issues. So they try to do some washing, how to say it, 
things that are not, they, they, they just try to come up with programs that, that they claim are addressing the problem, but they will not speak against witchcraft beliefs. I went to a UN meeting in Geneva and I was like, hey, yes, we are taking this campaign to the UN, and when we speak from there, the whole world will listen to us and we'll get to the root of this problem. And UN um, officials, they came, they said, oh, they're not interested in thoughts, they're not interested in beliefs, they're interested in actions. I said, you are causing confusion, for goodness sake. What is this? You, what motivates action? Is it not belief? Why can't you talk about it? They don't want to talk about the belief because they don't want to offend the people. They don't want to do anything against their tradition and culture. You are now waiting for action when they will cut off somebody's head and cut off the person. That's when they, will, that's when they want to act. The UN is failing us. I want to tell you that today. They are failing us. And from the way they are doing it, this problem is not going away. And I will hold them responsible. I'm saying it here. Put it on record. I will hold them responsible because they are wasting the money. They organize programs for witchcraft believers and tell them, oh, we don't want to offend you, you know, because they don't want to be accused of racism. They don't want to be accused of neocolonialism. Now you want to be accused of endorsing witchcraft belief in a witchcraft, in a workshop that's supposed to dispel witchcraft beliefs. What kind of nonsense is that? Too often, these institutions lack the political will to address the problem of witchcraft accusation. Some of these establishments have witchcraft believers as their local contacts. Come on. Just tell me, how are you going to do how I go how? How are you going to win it? No way. Now, they have them as their local contacts, yes. And, um, and the organizations also do not take a categorical stand against witchcraft beliefs. They don't want to say there is witchcraft is superstition. No. They don't want to say there is no basis for such a belief. No. They are waiting for somebody to be shot, somebody to be the poor fuel or gasoline or somebody to get the person, but that's when they want to talk. So although accusations of witchcraft may be, ra may be raging uh, locally in African countries, there are global ramifications that should not be overlooked. Now, one thing about speaking towards the end of an event like this is that people must have addressed some of the issues. So I'm going to quickly um, point, point out this. So this is applicable to the threat of is Islamic extremism in Africa, in Asia, countries. In these places, people have been grappling with the issue of jihadist Islam. The vicious attack of Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, and affiliates are well known. And these militants have waged a violent campaign that have led to much destruction and bloodshed. Their state counterparts are enforcing Sharia law and flagrantly denying Muslims as well as non-Muslims their basic human rights. Now, I want to let you know that there is more violence being done to, in the name of Islam, much more than the physical, beheading, lynching, uh, what is it? Uh, killings, wars, protests. No. The real violence is being done structurally. Denial of positions, businesses, employment. Many people cannot get a job in certain parts of Nigeria because of their religion. Many people cannot be governor. Many people cannot be chief justice. They cannot vie for commissioners in Nigeria because they profess another religion and they, they live or they are part of, of the Sharia states. So, so by, make, by making people second class citizens, you do much more violence to them than even, there are few people that are killed, but more people suffer because they cannot get jobs or get into political or hold political offices because of their religion. Now, as in the case of witch hunting, Islamic extremism is a local phenomenon, some would say. But they have very strong international dimensions and ramifications. For instance, last month, some, some Muslim students at a law school in Lagos, Nigeria, threatened to lynch another student for making an offensive and derogatory post on Prophet Muhammad. Now, the question is this, and I know the, um, the last but one speaker they, it said, you know, address this issue. But the thing there is this. How do we know this thing that is insulting to Muhammad? If each time we will hear, oh, they start protesting, I'm sure you're going to see, the, you're going to see one of my slides, behead this person for this. How do you know what is insulting? How do you know what is derogatory? So somebody can just come up with it, and all of a sudden, somebody is killed. So, so it, the police intervened and brought the situation under control. 
Now, in past years, such threats have been actualized. Ac accusations of blasphemy have led to violent eruptions. Those accused of desecrating the Quran or insulting Allah and Prophet Muhammad have been murdered, beheaded, and lynched. Now, I, I, used to tell, I used to say this. Islam is a foreign religion in Nigeria. It's not a religion. And for Islam to thrive in Nigeria, the Ascol has criticized the traditional beliefs. And they are still criticizing traditional beliefs. Nobody has beheaded them for blasphemy. Nobody has beheaded them for insulting the traditional gods and their prophets. Now, immediately they get into the majority, they now tell you, you don't criticize Islam. And if you criticize, they usually frame it as insult and they want you killed. No. You started the criticism. You gave it, they took it. Now is their turn to take it. They must. Now, what happens is that in many of these countries, like in Indonesia, Bangladesh, alleged blasphemers have been killed and imprisoned. Instead of charging killers and arsonists, Sharia state actors in Nigeria have prosecuted alleged blasphemers, exonerating those who killed, maimed, and violated hum basic human decency in the name of Islam. Friends, these bureaucratic cavings are often indifference to translocal pressures and interests. So it is not just all about what is going on in Nigeria. Sometimes there are interests beyond Nigeria, in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, in uh, Sudan, and so many other places that are interested in what is going on. There are, they are demonstrations of allegiance to the global jihadist networks that sometimes operate out of Western countries. Yes, they don't operate out of Nigeria. They operate sometimes out of here. And how do they operate? As international NGOs, as human rights organizations, as foundations, as charities, jihadist establishments in Western nations actively campaign to force Islamic privilege on the world. They set up Quranic indoctrination centers. They provide scholarship to indigent Muslims and imams. They give them free air ticket to Saudi Arabia for pilgrimages and to other places. They fund the construction of mosques and schools in Ghana, Nigeria, and Gambia. When I used to go to Gambia for IHU work, I traveled around. They told me that a particular foundation was constructed, um, one mosque each on each school compound. And you know what happened? The, the mosque looked more magnificent than the classrooms. I mean, the windows, everything. But the classrooms, some of them, they don't have windows. Some of them, they don't have doors and all that. They don't have uh, facilities, learning facilities in the classroom. But they, they, they must, well painted. So, so the, the, the jihadist interest groups use states such as Pakistan, Nigeria, Sudan, and a block of states such as OIC as fronts to sponsor resolutions that criminalize the criticism of religion or, or so-called Islamophobia. Although humanists may be living in risky and dangerous situations in, in their various countries, there are international aspects and mechanisms that could be explored and used to address this situation. However, there are concerns regarding these initiatives, even from humanists. Now, humanists in certain parts of the world question the ability to influence the situation in some of these countries. After the parliamentary function, somebody came to me. Do you think there's anything New Zealand could do to influence the situation in Indonesia? I said, yes. I didn't want us to start debating or start arguing. Yes, and I mean it. It's only that will New Zealand do that? Especially the politicians, when they think their immediate, their interests, there's, no, there's no immediate threat to their own interests, or their citizens are not involved. That is another question. So many humans are worried that such interventions would not be effective or could even make the situation worse. Others are actually opposed to all international solidarity initiatives, lest they be accused of racism, imperialism, or neocolonialism. By the way, some years ago, a Ghanaian, a, a, a Ghanaian said to me, after I raised the concerns regarding witchcraft persecution in their country, is your country Nigeria not the capital of witch, African witchcraft? Just look at your Nollywood films that, produced, that, they, that they produce. 
it is all about witchcraft. Yes. Now, some European humanists have, have especially opposed the idea of secular countries acting to protect humanists in, at risk in various countries. And one of them said this to me. So he said, you know, this invites accusations of imperialism and suggestions of lack of cultural sens sensitivities. Any intrusion by myself as a white person will be met with the same answer. White ignorance, bigotry, supremacy, imperialism, colonialism, Italia. Not everybody. You cannot say because some people said it, you now generalize and you say you cannot act. Actually, the guy posted this in reaction to my, my st the statement I made at the parliament. And I have been very kind to him because we've been very friendly all the while. So I've been very kind to him. Yes, people make such accusations. But will you, because of that, say you are not going to campaign on behalf of people who could be killed, or, or who could be killed let's say, in Saudi Arabia or in Mauritania because you'll be accused of uh, imperialism? Then you are not convinced of what you, what you stand for. You are not committed at all. Sorry. And if you think you'll be accused, then keep quiet and go away. away. Stop, stop posting this on my wall. Yes. I need those who want to work with me. Those who think we could make some difference. So another person suggested along the same line that any outside intervention will only achieve opposite effects, accusations of imperialism. Um, African countries must adopt liberal tolerant values by themselves through education and openness to outside world. Um, I understand that it is a long and protracted process that will take genera generations, but there is no substitute. Hmm. I don't like hearing this, but okay. And I know a bit about Africa. I haven't lived there for 11 years. 11 years is not enough. I was born there and I have lived there for over 40 years. So uh, can you agree with me? I will leave you at the 11th floor, but I'm at the 40th floor talking. Well, there are other substitutes and better substitutes. And we have seen that here today from the presentations we have listened to. That there are ways we can always work together and make a difference. A synergy of local and international efforts provides an effective option. No doubt, these concerns, these concerns that humanists are raising are valid. Any intervention could lead to certain allegations. But should that be a reason not to mobilize the global social capital and put into effect international humanist solidarity? Now, accusations of racism and imperialism are usually made by those who have vested interest in the status quo and are opposed to any positive and progressive change. Now, the forces of witch hunting, forces of fanaticism, forces of, of homophobia have, been, uh, have well lubricated international networks that are mobilized and used to prosecute or, 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 or to organize riots, to trigger violent clashes to protest the cartooning of Prophet Muhammad or the burning of the Quran and other religious offenses. Now look, they will do a cartoon in Denmark. They will be killing people who are protesting in the streets of Nigeria. Why? They will do a cartoon or burn the Quran, let's say in the US, people will be rioting in Afghanistan. Why? Is Afghanistan the same, are they in the same country? No, they're not even in the same region. So if fanatics, have their own international network. Humanists, you don't want to have? I'm sorry. I will not be part of that. Because we need international network of humanists to counter the international network of fanatics. And I'm here. Convince me otherwise. I'm here. Tell me why we should keep quiet and allow people to burn and kill people in Nigeria for Quran burnt in the U.S. or for cartoon published in Denmark, and you are telling me ah, people should stay in their countries, handle your problems. They're not handling their problems. Problem in one country is leading to conflict in another country. And you think that we should not come with a network to address this? Tell me that again. So they have this. They mobilize these resources. So humanists, should humanists stand by and allow religious and superstitious extremists to wreck and ravage the world? Shouldn't humanists synergize and make concerted efforts to resist these dark and destructive visions of fanatics? 
Now, at the parliamentary function in Wellington, the New Zealand, the New Zealand MP Grant Robertson made it clear that humanist values were urgently needed in the world today. He said it. He noted that humanist ideas will provide an effective guide in combating global religious extremism and in realizing a more tolerant and compassionate world. His declaration was a bold statement that rarely comes, comes out or really comes out from politicians or we, we really hear from politicians. Yes, I was inspired by his statement. It was short, but it was very inspiring. That is a call to duty. That is a call to action. If politicians with all, their, all the sensibilities they want to respect and manipulate could make that statement, what about ordinary humanists? So humans should answer this call to duty and action because humans' promises can only come into fruition if, law, if the law capital of humanism is adequately harnessed and effectively deployed around the globe. And who will do it? All the, these people, the, these people, behead those who insult Islam. Are they the people who do it? You will do it. We will do it. As far as I am concerned. So humanists who deem themselves fortunate by virtue of their life stance or the country where they reside should rise to the occasion and use their lock capital to benefit humanists, humanism, and humanity. Thank you. Okay, so we've got time for a few questions. Uh, thanks, Leo. Uh, you mentioned Islamophobia once. Uh, could you give us your opinion of the concept of Islamophobia? For me, Islamophobia doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense to me at all. If you watch, if I'm wrong, you correct me. This, the notion of Islamophobia is recent. I never had that maybe in the 80s or something and all my readings. It is a tool to shut down debate critical analysis of Islamic beliefs is another kind of blasphemy, you know, the, the, the so but coming with another name. And I used to tell them in Nigeria because, like people said, I operate from, that's my, my own base is Nigeria, Africa, like that. I used to tell them, our problem is not Islamophobia, but Islam-based phobia. Who are those killing blasphemers in the north? The Islamophobes? No. It's those who hate people because their religion or the way they understand their religion have made them to hate others. And they, 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 they value books. They value marks made on papers or artwork or whatever you call artwork. They value that more than human life. Now, when you speak out against that, they said you are an Islamophobe or they accuse you of Islamophobia. For me, it doesn't make sense. They need to really redefine and get that, they, 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 we call the concept of Islamophobia, they situate it in a way that I can understand. For me, it is an instrument to shut down the criticism of Islam, the criticism of Islam and Islamic beliefs and practices. And as long as it is used in that context, for me, it is antithetical to both intellectual, moral, cultural progress. It's antithetical even to the process of reforming Islam, getting rid of, in quote, mistaken notions embedded in Islamic traditions and teachings. That's my position.
thank you for your speech. I also feel the immediacy of your situation. Um, I just wonder if there has been a suggestion that the reformation of Islam could refer to Western practices and then become better. You know, that's a kind of imperial arrogance. We cannot do that. But can I ask you, do you believe that within Islam, principles are there, such as fiqh, uh, which challenges the immutable reading of Salafist uh, Islam? So is there, within Islam, uh, the possibility of uh, reformation, of modernizing, of understanding that there's really good reason in the modern world not to behave like a, a seventh century medieval uh, tyrant. Uh, and that the moderate Islamist uh, people, uh, perhaps they need to be more vocal on this, but my, I return the question to you because you know a lot about the ambitions of the caliphate. Uh, is there within Islam uh, a principle with Shabir Ali, who is a uh, imam, a moderate imam in, in London, speaks about? Thank you. Well, I will tell you my background, my own background is Christianity, but I live in a country where Islam affects our lives so much. And where sometimes part of the problem is the disagreement between those who belong to different schools. Like, I'm sure you know that better than I do, the Shia is the Sunni, sometimes the conflict. Like the leader of the Shiite in Nigeria now has been detained for several years now, you know, because of issues bordering on the internal politics. At, the, at um, about 2015, um, some members of another group who said that their own holy man or whoever was greater than Prophet Muhammad, that accused the person of blasphemy and they tried the person in the Sharia court and in jail. So we still have, in quote, room for interpretation and dialogue. But what happens is this. Which one is the dominant one? Our, our experience in Nigeria is that the dominant one shuts down and oppresses the minority voices. Because here now, in this context now, the reformation voice is going to be a minority, in quote. Even if it will be located within the traditions of interpretations within Islam. Because if it challenges what is the dominant belief and tradition, the person is threatened. Like this person and his followers were tried of blasphemy and they're in jail. Actually, they were sentenced to death, but I think they're in jail now. So the question there is, how do we get others who subscribe to different interpretations to accommodate what you can call, in quote, reformationist trends and interpretations? Yes. So, uh, and again, when, when people said within Islam, I said, why should it be within Islam? Why? Who says that a person to reform Islam must come from Islam? Why? What is in Islam that nobody doesn't understand? It is the same myth. They'll be telling you, oh yeah, Muhammad was in the cave and God dictated the Quran. I said, for how long? And he was, he was illiterate. This is, a, this is the kind of narrative they tell us in Nigeria. And immediately you ask question, they get angry. You are telling somebody very ridiculous stories and the person asks you a question and you're getting angry. For what? So what I'm saying there is that the reformation may not actually only come from within, it can also come from without. Because Islam is not living, it's not a monoculture, it's not, it's not the only culture. It, it, it has interactions with other cultures. And there are people who like certain aspects of Islam, but who may not call themselves Muslims. So what I'm saying there is that Islam, in quote, should be open to reformative trends and interpretations, whether from within or from without.
Uh, yeah, but again, yeah, yeah, you see, yeah, oh no, well, you see, when you get to these statistics, I get worried because are you counting the terrorists and, uh, and all these people who are, are they part of them? Yeah. 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 That's like that many times a population of Brazil. So there's a huge amount of terrorism. You see, you see, well, I, let me just say this. When people come, they say, like in Nigeria, they said, oh, yeah, we have um, how many millions of 50 million um, uh, Christians and all that, including those who don't know the Bible. Those who don't, who don't know anything. There are many people, oh, are you Christian? They can't do sense or they just tick. They don't understand the details. This is we are discussing here. They don't understand that. So sometimes let us really put aside this game of numbers, okay? And look at the material in question. In other words, Islamic material. So, and again, we are not living in a world like maybe some like Pakistan. Nigeria is not like Pakistan, okay? There are, there are a lot of uh, religious groups competing. So what you have in Nigeria is religious competition. So you can't, you can't tell me that you are not ready to sit on the table and have your own ideas criticized. No. Directly or indirectly. That's why I said the reformation of Islam must not necessarily come from inside. It can also come from outside. Because Islam is now, in some countries, one of the religions. So it's a voice. It's a perspective. It's an outlook. So there are other competing outlooks. And in situations of competition... The merit of your claims will have to be challenged by others. So, so that is it. That's why I said this change, this reformation may come from as a result of pressures and perspectives from within and also pressures and perspectives from without. Leo, hello. Um, I'd like to take you back to where you started from. That is the uh, child witchcraft accusations, uh, uh, which... Um, are, uh, as you well know, uh, endemic in Nigeria, but also in many other countries uh, in Africa. Um, and I'm concerned about what we can do about it. And I'm thinking about Humanists UK. I mean, clearly, we can denounce it in the UN Human Rights Council when we're speaking there. Uh, but um, our own influence over such cults is very distant and very tiny and possibly counterproductive. Is there... Um, any degree to which the mainstream churches, say the Church of England, um, are complicit um, in any of this or in, in ignoring it, in failing to do what they could do, because they would have greater influence? Okay, I'll, I'll really start with the last one. Now, I want to tell you, to the best of my knowledge, the Pope in Rome, he doesn't know what many priests are doing in villages in Nigeria. He doesn't know. Even the bishops, the local bishops, they don't know. So that is why sometimes when you talk about the Anglican, you know, as a communion, what they could do. So, yeah, they have a power sometimes to make pronouncements. But to what extent will that be effective? That is it. And... And again, the church institution, the religious institutions, they are inherently ambiguous and contradictory. They contradict themselves. Let me give you just this example. We, appla we appeared before a commission of inquiry in Nigeria on witchcraft accusation, and a priest came. So in the course of the cross-examination, they asked this Catholic priest, do you believe in witchcraft? He said, as an, as a, as an individual, no. As a church, yes. How do you place that? <laughs> How do you place it? So that is it. So definitely we should find a way to keep bringing this issue up so that they could be making pronouncements that could help us or at least minimize the problem. But as an institution, they're part of the problem because they can't do away without recognizing the supernatural and supernatural rule of evil forces and demonic forces, and like I said. Then at the UN... What can we do? We keep raising. Let's keep raising the issue so that let's keep it, the, is it on the front burner so that organizations will know that 
this is still a problem that needs to be addressed because they have not been addressed properly. Okay, thank you so much.